Hi everyone, my name is Chris Malone and I love cartoons. Now, I usually go by Chris, but I also go by the name Killica in a lot of art circuits such as uh, comic book conventions and whenever I do talks to uh, various different schools. Uh, the reason why I do that is because I, I think I'm like the 13th Chris Malone on IMDb, so I like to use this as my pen name to help me stand out from all of the other Chris Malones in the industry. Like a lot of other cartoonists, uh, I, I've been drawing pretty much all of my life, uh, starting back in the 1980s where I would sit glued to the television screen uh, watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But unlike a lot of other kids uh, during that time, um, I would watch it because I was fascinated with how they moved. I was fascinated with the stories and the characters, uh, so much to the point where I would sneak into my parents' office, steal a lot of their... Uh, printer paper, and I would just be drawing the Ninja Turtles um, every Saturday morning, as well as pretty much straight after school. Um, I would just come right home, steal some paper, and get to work. The Ninja Turtles are such an inspiration for me that I actually have an arcade cabinet over in my uh, office right next to my desk, so sometimes whenever I just need a break, I'll stand up and I'll just start playing the game. Oh my god, baby, you have a deadline! In a minute! So my first job in the industry actually happened even before I finished grad school, uh, working for the Emmy award-winning show uh, Archer. I was on the illustration team, uh, where I would do things such as character illustrations, asset design, prop design, keyframes, and pretty much everything that the illustration team uh, covers. Speaking of grad school, uh, I got my BFA in Kinetic Imaging at Virginia Commonwealth University, which consists of animation, film, and audio design. And then I went to Savannah College of Art and Design, where I got my MFA in Sequential Art. Storyboarding is my favorite aspect in making cartoons. Uh, I feel that it is the area where, uh, that brings out the most visual storytelling. And I wanted to pursue that, and so after working in Archer, I took on a job for Cyanide and Happiness doing animatics and storyboards for their YouTube channel. Hi, uh, can I get a large fry, burger, apple pie, Diet Coke, um, hmm. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, what? Uh, I, I can't understand you. No, you need to speak clearly. Look, let me just drive up to the next window. Okay, now I want a... Oh, that'll take a minute. Just pull up to the front. And here's your apple pie. Now drive, drive, drive! Careful, it's hot! So I still do a lot of animated shorts with Cyanide and Happiness from time to time, um, but this opened up the door for me to work as a, a storyboard artist for a lot of other really cool shows, such as Adam Ruins Everything. No way, pal. Touch was the ruler of a kingdom. He did great things. Hey, amigos at home, can you name one of King Tut's accomplishments? That's right, there are none. The WWE with WWE Storytime. And when I was eight years old, at that time, typewriters were about 70 to 100 pounds. They were the big, metal, fat typewriters. If anyway, I wanted to see how strong I was. So I picked it up. I had good form though. Lifted with the legs and the hips and I threw the typewriter off the balcony and it was during the day. It could have killed somebody. Luckily it didn't. It smashed into a hundred pieces. To even Baby Shark on Nickelodeon. 
the most famous shark in the whole wide water, that's you, baby shark, has some very big news. Like shark-sized news. So I, I do a lot of background illustration for different cartoons uh, as well. Um, I, I kind of got my start with that because in a lot of my backgrounds for my storyboards and animatics for all those different cartoons, I would hide a lot of jokes and Easter eggs into the background. I would always try to be able to cram in as many as I could. One of my favorite musicians is uh, Kazumi Tataka. Uh, he is famous for doing a lot of the music for Nintendo, but one of the things that he's really well known for is uh, this 19 note song that he will hide in most of the video games that he works on. Uh, in order to find this video game, maybe you have to input controls in a certain order, or maybe you have to let a song loop 64 times in order for that song to play, but it becomes a scavenger hunt for video gamers to be able to find that little song hidden in every single one of his games. Taking influence from that, <laughs> in a lot of the cartoons that I work on, I like to hide my pets, uh, like my dogs or my guinea pigs, somewhere in the background or somewhere in the cartoon whenever possible. <laughs> so if you couldn't tell, I really like my pets. And I include them in a very personal project that I've been working on called My Life as a Background Character, where I have been drawing myself and one of my dogs in a, uh, a different animation style for the last two years. And it's my goal to eventually reach over 200 different designs. I also use this as a teaching tool uh, because I like to encourage and challenge all of my students to branch out from the styles that they're comfortable with and try a new style that they've never done before. This will help to be able to make them a much more flexible cartoonist. My friends and I also run a small animation studio in Atlanta called Raging Viking Productions, where I am the lead background artist in addition to working on storyboards. All right, so one of the projects that we're working on is uh, something that I'm extremely excited for because it's something I've always wanted to do uh, throughout my entire career. We are working on an animated short for the online series called Game Grumps. So not only do I get to be able to work on a dream project of mine, uh, I also got to uh, write it. I got to do the storyboards, the backgrounds, and the character designs. And I'm really, really uh, excited to be able to share it when it releases this summer. Also with Raging Viking Productions, we're hoping to get into uh, sketch comedy uh, with animated shorts, such as the one you're about to see here. We now return to First Time House Hunters. Apocalypse Edition. We love our new home, and it's in a great school district. We're having a little bit of a problem with the neighbors. Woo! Give me your gut lasagna! Ah! That's you my husband, motherfucker! All right, well, thank you guys for watching that. If you couldn't tell, um, I'm just very passionate about cartoons um, and both making them and watching them. Um, and I like to be able to take that passion that I have and bring that into the classroom because animation can be a long, tedious process. And I like to be able to make it as fun as possible, which I believe brings out stronger and more fun cartoons in the end. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. And I really look forward to seeing you again for the last Wednesday lunch uh, this April. Catch you then. Hi, my name is Don Robson. I'm an associate professor of painting and drawing in the School of Art and Design at Kennesaw State University. And I'm here to talk about a couple of works I had at the Zuckerman Faculty Show in the spring of 2021. I'll share my screen. Uh, I had three works in the show that were gouache paintings on found book pages. Uh, for a few years, I've been collecting, well, more than a few, I've been collecting antique books, antique illustrated books. And uh, I had a really great one of uh, the stories of James Fenimore Cooper with these very beautiful engravings in them, uh, steel plate engravings, uh, not litho press. These are actual engravings. They still have the emboss, embossment around the edges of the plate, plate marks on the paper. Just gorgeous, gorgeous things. 
Um, and I would use these, often use old illustrations um, as a, a way to do my work. I would use bits and pieces of them for my own paintings, watercolors and drawings. Um, but I, and I looked at these and I had quite a few and I thought, you know, um, maybe I could work with this. So I decided to do some painting on top of the book pages, sort of preserving the beautiful original etching as well as adding my own um, elements to it. So uh, the first piece here is called Thrust. And in the original engraving, we had a uh, story of a shipwreck. And uh, we see in the background there uh, a sailor about to be overthrown by a giant wave, a uh, dangerous ordeal uh, of nature, a very exciting story. Um, great engraving, he on the, uh, the prow of the boat with the lovely uh, figurehead below it. So I started going through my other stocks of images that I worked from and uh, wondering what I could do with this. And so I used these jet engines. Um, I had an image from, I've worked with them before. And uh, I said, you know, uh, jet engines, uh, sort of contemporary um, travel and technology of movement across the globe, just as the old sailing ships were. And I decided to put them in the image sideways. Um, originally thought I'd have them flying across the top of the image, but I wanted to sort of give a implied danger. So I took the jet engines and uh, turned them sideways to sort of show that something here is not right. The, uh, the plane is going down, um, perhaps a, a subtle sense of danger. Uh, use gouache, it's very compatible with working on paper. Um, and it's uh, watercolors too weak. Gouache is a little more substantial tool to work with. And uh, I wanted to overlap the image and but not completely hide it, sort of have a conversation between the two, two images that uh, are together on the piece. So um, really pretty pleased with this one. Um, so, uh, so let's look at our next one. This is a uh, work is called Record, and uh, here in the original etching here, we see these appear to be uh, these people being led by a Native American across the plains. I'm not familiar with the story, but uh, another kind of ordeal here. And I used an image of this boy in uh, a dunce cap and his little private school, Catholic school outfit there, uh, recording or making an image of what they see. So this is a piece is called record, or it could be pronounced record, I guess. It's another way to look at it. Uh, trying to keep the scene. So the, the artist there is my little avatar. He's sort of a, a bit of a self-portrait I've used uh, before. Uh, the artists in the studio recording great events. So we'll look at the next one. Uh, this piece is titled Birds of Prey. In the original image, we have these hunters. Uh, they're taking a break, I suppose, from their hunt. They've got their hunting dogs with them. And down at the very bottom, you can see there's a, a deer stag that they have, they have killed and having a conversation. Uh, and what I decided to put over them were these uh, birds of prey. Um, I have, I often go to uh, natural history museums, in Chicago, it's, grew up in Pittsburgh, uh, to the, at the Carnegie Natural Museum. And I used to always photograph the dioramas of the uh, stuffed animals that they have uh, in like recreations of their natural habitat. Um, I'm a big collection of them. And one of the th weird things they have there are these large glass cases with these birds, all kinds of birds, um, sitting on these little branches coming out of the wall. And it's just weird. It's sort of a scene where it looks like, why are all these birds in the same place, perching at the same time in this glass box? Uh, they're very real, very organic, and uh, at the same time, they're in this sterile environment. So it's, I like these photographs, they're kind of strange. But the, uh, for this, I decided, yeah, I'll put these birds of prey in. They're hunters as well. 
So this one, I have them sort of scattered around in a sort of offset circle around the circle of all those uh, images, the image I have underneath it. They're all kind of in these circular formats. Um, and I wanted to be real faithful to them, just like at the museum. They're really very careful with these animals, trying to, you know, preserve them, show them to people. So here I was trying to be as careful as I could with the details of the birds and their coloring. Uh, very fine brushes, making very small details on these birds. And they're sitting on the branches that sort of come out of the wall, come out of the image, these, these uh, twigs that they're on. And you see the little um, rectangles down at the bottom near each bird. Those are, those are actually the wall labels that they use at the museum to describe the bird, just like uh, the wall labels that are next to artwork in a museum. Uh, I thought I'd preserve those as well as part of this. Uh, so these are the three works I have in the show. I have many more of these etchings, all by the done by the same artist, same engraver, same format. Uh, again, intensely, tightly done images, these etchings. That's why these birds were, I tried to be as intense and tight with them as well. So I look forward to, you know, maybe another 20 or so of these uh, these works. Uh, I like to work in a series. Uh, so uh, that will probably take me a while over the next few years while I do a few other things. Uh, those are the three works in this series, the book page series. I really enjoyed working on them. Um, gouache was a little new to me. It took me a few attempts to figure out how to, to get uh, the effects I wanted. Uh, working with gouache, trying to get some, the same kind of effects that I get with oil. Um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, there's a, please come see the work. And uh, it was a great pleasure talking to you guys. Thanks again. We have a global issues from overconsuming, global plastic pollution, chemical exposures, and more. My name is Christine Kim, Associate Professor of Graphic Communications Concentration at Kansas State University. I have brought my passion for upcycling to my art projects last over 10 years. Currently, my artwork, Earth Matters piece, has been presented since January 23rd in the Morton Gallery, and it will be ended May 9th. Being an avid computer user for over three decades, I have thrown away a fair share of tech items, mainly due to updating to newer system. However, I have also collected many items for keepsake. And as I have grown my passion for upcycling, I wanted to utilize the items just a holding space in my home for a new found purpose. This artwork is not a reformed figure nor a specific object but by arranging them within the wooden frame and overflow the frame for the sculpture, I wanted to highlight the humanities unnecessary need for overconsumption. I hope we can activate more conversation and solutions through art. This slide shows different views of my artwork. Now, I would like to show my work when I started upcycling project back in 2012. I had my solo exhibition in 2012 at Dasan Art Museum. 2012 New Year's prolific art exhibition, the dragon at the Dasan Art Museum offered several parts. For the part one, I was invited for communicating with the society with my artwork, which was still unfamiliar with the new media work to them. I created a mural artwork for the whole gallery space. We live in the society of materialism and constant changes every day. We do ruin nature and our living environment by striving for more changes and over wasting. There is a vicious Circle the destroyed nature and environment resulted in global warming and odd weather changes that affect to our daily lives badly. 
I used A4 scratch paper for printing simplified forms of bird, fish, tree, which are designed for patterns of mural artwork. Birds are flying fast for creating messages. Fishes are also flying for one us, our nature. And trees are there all the time for us. Beautiful design is not important in my design, but clean and sincere design of the clear message is necessary for delivering to the people with my hope of going back to nature. Texting became a new way of communication in our society. Society, the traditional communication as such as face-to-face -face engagement, take, talking and writing have become less important to the newer generation. Writing on paper is now less important in our lives. For my work, I utilize the use letter and documents to print my design, delivering a strong message about texting. My work introduces the new communication form and sustainability, which is my concern and interest towards global issues. And my work is overflow the wall. And you can see the other side of this, the other side of the wall. Um, and my work is um, kind of, you can see my artwork, the other side of my artwork through the window from the, um, the corridor. I created a lamp artwork with Youth Magazine in 2013. I have many magazines I already read and I didn't need them anymore. And at the same time, I was inspired by book art project. So I uh, made the lamps with a magazine. I placed the lamp inside of this book um, and making, um, it looks like um, it's working like a lamp. Now I used the fish wire to hang it from the ceiling. So they look like a floating in the air. In 24, from the previous project, I got different idea using magazine pages. And I rolled the magazine pages and arranged them to create different volumes and contours. And my work was a part of the artist highlight series. And I was very honored that my work was displayed at the Bailey Performance Center Art Room. Um, this Bailey um, Performance Arts Center hosts over 100 performances and other public events. So my work was exposed to many people and the public. And during the pandemic in 2020, there was a juried exhibition called Art as Activism, Sustainability and Social Justice. And I created Black Lives Matter and my compassion and contributions for Black lives that have been harmed in every fiber of society is to create this upcycling artwork with my continuous commitment to sustainability. Hope that viewers can contemplate deeply about Black lives as well as their own lives. We love to live and we live to love. And also I created um, the project um, called the New Life for the same exhibition. And it's typically to see use of this, um, the paper rolls and also um, the paper towel rolls at home and trash to when all the paper is gone. A lot of upcycling projects are purposeful and functional, including New Life. Instead of sending rolls to the landfill, I use them as the main material for my expressive and experimental artwork. My effort was to give them a new significance. And thank you very much for watching my presentation. Hi there. My name is Paige Birch, and I am a lecturer of sculpture and the Master Craftsman Program Coordinator for the School of Art and Design here at Kennesaw State University. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to me talk about my art. 
I would also like to thank Elizabeth Thomas and the staff of the Zuckerman Museum for hosting this faculty exhibition and putting together this last Wednesday lunch session. Today, I will give you a brief rundown of my sculpture titled 2020 Self-Portrait, or how I decided to cobble together my different research threads and make a ridiculous, dead-eyed self-portrait that wholly reflects the asinine year in which it's conceived. Yes, that is the title. And so what I'm going to do is go through the slideshow, let you see some of the process and the description of how it was made, and I'm going to talk over this slideshow so that you get a better understanding of how the piece came about. The piece is cast bronze and stands 24 inches tall and is 4 inches by 4 inches in length and width. Despite being a self-portrait, the piece reflects me very well in other ways. Over the course of the slideshow, I will talk a little bit about my motivations as a maker and then speak to how this piece came about and the process in which it was created. I'm a very open person and I speak very plainly about mental illness and how it affects my daily life. I am bipolar and have a history of mental illness that runs throughout my family. A lot of my work deals with this in one form or another. I am by nature a highly skeptical person with a very dark sense of humor and these things often show in my work. I identify things which are difficult to talk about and try to use black humor to start conversations about them. Uh, this piece is no exception. I believe it's safe to say that 2020 was a very difficult, uh, albeit memorable, year for everyone uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, personally, the year started fine, I actually thrived during the lockdown, and it was not until mid-September that things uh, began unraveling for me. Uh, that's when a number of personal issues began, and I really struggled for the last quarter of the year. I fell into one of the deeper depressions that I've ever had to deal with, and that's how this piece uh, came about. Uh, the piece follows a series of pieces uh, which I made that serve as maquettes for memorials to the end of society. And after the struggles of 2020, I decided to make a sarcastic monument to mediocrity, uh, which features myself. And so the piece is a fairly formal work, but as the title suggests, it merges some of my current research threads. And I've been working uh, with digital fabrication for the past year and utilizing technology and sculpture whenever I'm able to. I've also been researching and working with traditional wooden pattern making processes for foundry practice. Uh, the entire piece was cast using those processes. Uh, the cast head at the top of the column was made by first digitally scanning my head, 3D printing it in resin, taking a rubber mold off of that, and then creating a wax replica. This wax replica was then put into a sand mold, melted out, and cast in bronze. The column was turned on a lathe from poplar wood and split down the middle in a process called split pattern turning. This is how they used to make objects such as cannons. The base of the column also has a number of smaller page faces in a variety of different expressions. You have smiling page, frowning page, and face mask wearing page. These pieces represent uh, the past year fairly well. So the rest of the base was then heavily textured with wax, molded in sand, and cast in bronze. The two pieces were welded together and a dark brown patina was added to give it a traditional aged bronze appearance. If you want to look past the outward appearance of the piece, you can find some allusions to mental illness and my bipolar disorder, uh, namely the different states in which I'm represented on both uh, the top and the bottom of the piece, uh, the literal highs and lows, as well as metaphorical ones. I have placed myself both at the peak as well as the lowest possible point, um, which are, you know, the physical embodiments of the manic and the depressive episodes that I struggle with. Uh, 
there really is no middle ground page, uh, just one or the other. Uh, that's basically uh, the way life is lived, and so that's the way um, I chose to represent myself in this piece. And so, much like the rug in The Big Lebowski, uh, I think the title really ties the whole thing together. Uh, I've always had a fondness for ridiculous titles, and I usually choose to go this route. Um, I believe that titles like these show that you can have more fun with art than many people are accustomed to, and it really uh, is just another thing that many people take too seriously, and it gives me an opportunity to have some fun uh, even when I'm dealing with serious content. And so I hope that this talk was insightful, uh, and if not, I'll make sure to get your uh, refund check in the mail promptly. So thank you very much for uh, your time and your patience in listening to me ramble. Thank you for joining us today. This concludes the final installment of our four-part series in the last Wednesday lunch program for spring semester, presenting short talks by faculty artists in the 2021 SOAD Faculty Exhibition. If you missed any of the previous faculty artist talks, you can find them in the past program section of our website. Please come back for our last Wednesday lunch program in May when we will hear from Professor Paige Birch as he shares a number of the municipal public art projects completed by students in the School of Art and Design Master Craftsman program. That exhibition will be on display here in our Fine Art Gallery in the Wilson Building from May 11th through July 10th. On June 30th, we have local artist Jess Jones here to discuss her artistic practice and installation Weeping Quilt currently on display in the museum. Later in the summer, on July 28th, we'll hear from Georgia Deal and Nancy Zimler regarding their work with Dennis O'Neill and the Handprint Workshop International, which is a focus of one of our summer exhibitions in the Zuckerman. On August 25th, we will hear from Hannah Amuka, SOAD alum and juror of the SOAD Alumni Biennial, which will be in the Fine Arts Gallery in the second half of July through August following the Master Craftsman Show. Thank you for your continued interest in the educational programs of the Zuckerman Museum of Art. If you have any suggestions for this series or feedback in general, please contact me, Elizabeth Thomas, at the email address on your screen. Until next time, 